So uh, we come now to Acts chapter 16 and uh, verses 11 to uh, 40. And there are four ideas uh, that helps us from here to, to understand how the Holy Spirit works in um, taking the gospel and in opening doors for the gospel uh, in order to bring salvation to people. So uh, the, the first idea is, is that uh, when the Holy Spirit opens a door for the gospel, he opens the heart and fills it with love. Verses 11 to 15, let's read this together. From Troas we put out to sea and sailed straight to Samothrace, and the next day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, a Roman colony and a leading city of the district of Macedonia. We stayed in that city for several days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the city gate by the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and spoke to the women gathered there, a God-fearing woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, was listening. The Lord opened her heart to respond to what Paul was saying. After she and her household were baptized, she urged us, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, Come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we saw last week that uh, the Lord uh, did not allow the gospel to be proclaimed in several big districts. Uh, Asia, Mysia, Bithynia. So the, the gospel was prevented from going into those areas. But here, uh, the gospel has come to Macedonia, so it crossed over to the other side, right? And this is the first city in Europe uh, that the, uh, the gospel came to. And uh, we can see that there was no synagogue in the place, and so Paul had to go outside of the city to a little river outside where he, um, people usually go to pray. Uh, we, we're not sure whether they were praying to God or they're praying to something else, but Paul went there with Silas and, uh, and the others, and there they found a group of women. Right? We don't really know what happened to the men. Maybe they were drunk uh, Saturday night or something. They were partying. But the women were there. And, and here is the women listening to Paul. And the Lord opened the heart of Lydia. We know that probably Lydia was a, a wealthy woman because she was a, a dealer of purple clothes. She was selling purple clothes. She came from another city, Thyatira, uh, in the uh, region of Asia, right? And he's able, she's able to live with her family uh, in Philippi. To be able to live there, she has to pay for a house or something. So she, she's a wealthy woman. We found out at the end of, the, of, this, uh, of this chapter that it was her house where the first church in Europe uh, had become and, and were established. But the Lord opened her heart. The Lord opened her heart to listen to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is my prayer that the Lord will do the same every time you come to listen to the word of God being read, the word of God being proclaimed. That the Lord opens your heart because you know the Lord can also harden your heart like he hardens the heart of Pharaoh. Right? In the Exodus chapter 4, verse 21, he comes and he knocks at the, at the door of our hearts. So many people say that uh, the Lord is not able to, to touch our hearts, but that is not true. See, the Lord made our heart, he created our heart, and he's able to touch our heart and turn it to him. You know, without him opening our hearts, we would never turn to God. And so it is um, for us to pray yeah. It is a mandatory for us to ask the Lord every day we come to listen to his word. That he will open our hearts, open our ears, so that we don't just listen to the word of God, but we'll take it in. right? And, 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 and allow the word of God to fill our hearts with love. So you see what happened to her at the end? She said, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay in my house. So she, she's a wealthy woman. She used to live for herself. You sell purple clothes, you know, to amass money to herself, uh, get a big house for her and her family, live comfortably in the world. But now she's converted. She, all the properties, all her stuff that is given to her by the Lord, she turned it to be used by the Lord for the believers. See, her heart's so filled with, the, with love for the brothers, the sisters in Christ. And this is the sign of the Christian. Do you remember what Jesus said? The world would know that you are my disciples when you love one another. 
Yes, of course, we are called to love other people outside the church, but our love for the brothers and the sisters within the church of God is the sure sign that we've been converted. And when there is an unloving spirit that uh, becomes uh, dominant in us, it really tells us that we are not yet converted. So we must pray that the Lord will open our hearts and fill our hearts with the love of God so that we are able to forgive each other. We're able to be patient with each other. We're able to live with each other and pray for each other and reach out to each other, right? So the Lord opened the hearts when he opens a door for the gospel. Second point is this. When the Holy Spirit opens a door for the gospel, he sets us free from the money-making spirit which is against the gospel. Together, once we are on our way to prayer, a slave girl met us who had the spirit by which she predicted the future. She made a large profit for her owners by fortune-telling. As she followed Paul and us, she cried out, These men who are proclaiming to you a way of salvation are the servants of the Most High God. She did this for many days, Paul greatly annoyed. Turning to the Spirit, he said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out right away. When her owners realized that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. Bringing them before the chief magistrate, they said, These men are seriously disturbing our city. They are Jews and are promoting customs that are not legal for us Romans to adopt or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against them, and the chief magistrate stripped off their clothes and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had severely flogged them, they threw them in jail, ordering the jailer to guard them carefully. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to you. So there was a slave girl who had this spirit. And the spirit uh, get her to prophesy, to predict the future, but she was doing it for money. And see, we, we're told that, uh, that her masters, that they had a large profit. They made a large profit through her doing this. And even though she was telling the truth about Paul and Silas, see, she, she was saying uh, that, that you know, th these, th these men who are proclaiming to you a way of salvation are the servants of the Most High God. That was true. But she was doing it for financial gain. Now, this is a spirit that is always in all of us, that prevents us. Do you see? It prevents them from listening to the gospel. And when uh, Paul exercises his spirit, it comes against them. And, you know, it, it, and, and says, you, you guys are disturbing our city. You're disturbing our peace. Isn't that the kind of thing that, you know, when, when we say to the world, when we say to people, look, you know, you need not to go after money. And people are thinking to themselves, look, but how can we live comfortably in this world? You're disturbing our peace. Without money, we cannot live comfortably in this world. See, a lot of people believe that our comfort depends on money. But don't you see what money, what money does? You know, do you get money? You, we're told in the Bible that, it, that money has wings that flies like eagles. The eagles are the... The, the bird that flies the highest in, in, on, on earth. It's very uncertain. But you see, this is a spirit that is at work in us and turns us away from God. See, if this is what, what's in you, uh, you know, the gospel needs to come and exercise to remove this. The, the spirit of money making, trusting in money, wanting to make money and amass money to yourself, thinking that money will give you security at the end. Remember the rich fool? Uh, well, he thought that at the end, you know, he's amassed enough money for him to make sure that his spirit find rest in his money and his wealth. But at very, that very night, the Lord came and took his soul and said, look, who then will own what you have amassed to yourself? See, this is what happened with, with this kind of, it's a, it's a deceptive spirit, Right? It tells us, you know, to go after money as if we will find comfort, we will find peace. And that's what these people, these Romans are saying. This, the gospel is disturbing our peace, right? By telling us, by, by, by exercising this spirit from us. This is impractical. Don't you think that people in the world are saying to us, you know, when we say, look, you know, 
Money will never give you the happiness you're looking for. And people are saying, it's very impractical. Remember that rich uh, young ruler who came to Jesus and Jesus said to me, to, to him, go and sell all your possessions, give it to the poor. I'm sure a lot of us who are listening to that said, that's impractical. Jesus, does, don't you understand? We need money to pay for the bills and all those. Yes. If you have something to eat and clothing, you should be satisfied with it and believe that the Lord God, our Father in heaven, will provide for us on a daily basis what to eat, what to drink, what to wear. That's a promise from our Father in heaven who looks after the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. It should comfort us and it should give us contentment. You know, and help us out of this spirit. This is the spirit uh, you know, that, is, that is enslaving us and it stands against the gospel. This is why these people came against Paul and Silas and dragged them out and stripped them off their clothes and ordered to be, them to be beaten with rods. You see, this is not a, this is not a, a, a small, a trivial matter. You know? They, you know, they, they were injured from this beating and Paul says that he, that he was beaten three times in this kind of beating. And this is, the, this is the kind of spiritual forces that are at work in the world against us preaching the gospel. And it is our prayer that it's not, you know, this is not something that is enslaving you. But I do believe, you know, that you're sitting there and you're listening to yourself and you're saying, oh, this is impractical. That's the spirit that Paul is talking about. That's the money-making spirit. It's, you say to yourself, oh, it's impractical. How can I live without money? It's, that is what this spirit is saying to us, okay? And then number three, point number three, when the Holy Spirit opens the door to the gospel, even our persecutors cannot stop saving, cannot stop saving people. Let's read this together. Receiving such an order, he put them into the inner prison and secured their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake and the foundations of the jail were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains came loose. When the jailer woke up and saw the doors of the prison standing open, he threw his sword and was going to kill himself since he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul called out in a loud voice, Don't harm yourself because we're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. He escorted them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him, along with everyone in his house. He took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds right away. He and all his family were baptized. He brought them into his house, set a meal before them, and rejoiced because he had come to believe in God with his entire household. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So you see what the persecutors did? They make sure that Paul and Silas would never ever preach the gospel again in this city, right? They, made, they put them, so after slandering them, after saying that their gospel is impractical and illegal, they shouldn't be, pre, they shouldn't be proclaimed here, and, and these people are disturbing us, our peace. They put them in the inner prison and secured their feet, so making sure that they would no longer continue to propagate, to proclaim this gospel that is disturbing the peace of the city. But you see the, the power of praying and singing hymns to God? You know, I, 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 I hope that when you are doing your family prayers, you are singing. It would be good to sing songs because in the Bible we can see that there is power to singing. It defeats God's enemy in 2 Chronicles 20. Uh, you remember David playing the, the, uh, the, the harp against Saul with the evil spirit and casting out that spirit. Singing has a power to defeat the devil. But also praying. You know, we're told in Ephesians 6, that this is how we fight against the evil one. We fight on our knees. We put on all the, uh, the armors of God and then we are on our knees praying. And so the enemy was defeated. You know, God came and set them free. And then eventually we can see 
that Paul and Silas in prison were free because they continued to do their praising and their singing. It was the jailer that, was, that needed to be set free. He was the one who was enslaved. He was enslaved to death. Do you see what he, did? he wanted to do? He wanted to harm himself because he, his, his work, his job as a soldier bound him to death. If he lost the, the slaves, the prisoners that he's put under his care, yeah, he's meant to take his life. Right? But you see, here he was set free by, by the gospel. Right? And then he came to Paul and asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your household. You see, this world promises us jobs and all kinds of uh, promotions. But it's a godless world, isn't it? You work and you mess things with it, you retire, you get the boat, you get the dog, you get the house near the beach and everything, and then you die. And that's, you see, we are, we are enslaved to that kind of life by this world. And that's what this jailer was enslaved to. But he was saved. No wonder at the end he rejoiced because he has come to believe God with his entire household. Now he's been set free from being enslaved to death by his job. As a soldier, he's now enslaved to Christ, to life, him and his family. And there is joy in him believing with his family. You know, it is our prayers that the Lord would do that in our midst. As he sets us free by faith in Christ, as he opens our senses to listen to the gospel, he will put joy in our hearts. The joy of being saved, the joy of knowing that there is hope. If we don't live for this world, then we die. There is eternal life. There is hope. There is the hope of the resurrection of the dead. We will be raised one day in glory. And then lastly, when the Holy Spirit opens a door for the gospel, our suffering is justified in the eyes of the world. Together, when daylight came, the chief magistrate sent the police to say, release those men. The jailer reported these words to Paul. The magistrate have sent orders for you to be released. So come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They beat us in public without a trial, although we are Roman citizens, and threw us in jail. And now, are they going to send us away secretly? Certainly not. On the contrary, let them come themselves and escort us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, they were afraid when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. So they came to appease them, and escorting them from prison, they urged them to leave down. After leaving the jail, they came to Lydia's house, where they saw and encouraged the brothers and sisters and departed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks to you, sir. So you see, they came to Lydia's house. That's what I was saying before. Lydia's house was the first church in Europe. Right? And, and that's where they were gathering. And so they came and encouraged them. But here I think this, uh, this point is put here to show us that, you know, when, when we suffer for the gospel, it's important for the world to realize that we don't suffer for doing evil. And I think it's what's very important for Paul and Silas to show, you know, the, the public officials as well as the brothers and sisters in Christ. Because, you know, uh, they, they were suffering and, and they were beaten and thrown into jail like criminals. And imagine if they had left and, uh, and people would say, look, you know, those, those criminals started a church here. What are they doing here? See, it was important then for Paul and Silas to show that they, they, they did not suffer because of any crimes of their own. And this is what for us Christians, it's always important for us to suffer for doing good. If you suffer for doing good, we're told by Peter in 1 Peter 3.17, rejoice. Rejoice. We should not be suffering for doing something evil. And I think that's what he... So our suffering is justified in the eyes of the world, in the eyes of the brothers as well, because we should show the world we don't suffer because of evil. We suffer because we stand for the truth of the word of God.